Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for, uh, uh, for coming here to Thomson Reuters at Canary Wharf. Um, if you had to come from the city and fight the evening commuters, I'm sorry. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant journey, but I'm glad you all made it. Um, it's great to, to have you all here at what is the first of uh, a series of legal debates um, that we are hosting uh, going forward after today. Um, my name is Jan Koos Geesink. I'm the managing director of Thomson Reuters uh, for the legal business here in the UK. Um, and I admit unashamedly that my background with the company was with Reuters originally, and this format is somewhat stolen from a great uh, format in, in, Tom's, uh, in Reuters, which is the Newsmaker series. And I think this of, um, these series could become um, an, an equally uh, fantastic series um, in the market. The um, uh, topic of tonight, I'm, I'm not going to introduce that, um, but we have a fantastic uh, panel here gather for you tonight to have this debate. And uh, my only job now is to introduce the chair um, of this debate, which is uh, Reuters editor at large, um, Axel Felfall, who will be uh, your chair for the evening. And I hope to join you later on um, after the event for some drinks outside. So I wish you all a great evening. Axel. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much indeed, uh, Jankus. Uh, I'm delighted to have been asked to host this, uh, this series. Um, as you can imagine, we on the editorial side spend a lot, a lot of time trying to attract uh, reputable names into this uh, auditorium, onto this stage. It is an honor to be uh, hosting such an impressive panel um, for uh, the legal business this evening. Um, just before we start, I'm, I'm going to set a little bit of a, a background, but uh, I, I want to make sure you've all had a chance to vote, because this is what makes this sort of format fun. Um, you can do that. I'm just going to remind you how to do that. Then I'll set a little bit of context, and you can vote whilst I'm doing that. You can do that on the app. Um, I think it's up on the screen here. There you go. Select the event, select main session, uh, and cast your vote. Or you can text your vote. Um, and uh, I think we've got a, a slide to show you how to do that as well. You text legal debates to the number that's going to come up on your screen in a minute. There you go. It's at the top there. Um, you wait for a text back, and then you vote A for yes, B for no, and C for undecided. Right, um, our panelists are raring to go. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment. Um, my role is that of moderator. My views aren't relevant tonight, but I, I do want to briefly set the scene. Uh, the motion, don't free citizens need the right to be forgotten? Uh, clearly a timely subject in this age when nothing really fades away on its own, uh, and a subject that has inevitably stoked huge debate about competing freedoms. I'm sure most of you uh, are familiar with last May's landmark ruling from the ECJ, the European Court of Justice. Very quick recap, the court decided that uh, internet companies can indeed be made to remove inadequate, irrelevant, or excessive personal information from search engines. Now, that ruling has unsurprisingly sparked widespread debate among uh, free speech advocates and supporters uh, of privacy rights. The former have called it, among other things, unrealistic and naive, little more than censorship akin to marching into a library and forcing search engines to pulp books. Uh, the latter have called it, uh, again, among other things, a forward-looking decision which actually strengthens press freedom and a clear victory for the protection of personal data of Europeans. And this last point uh, is important, uh, made by the EC's Vice President, Vivian Redding. Um, at the beginning of this month, a panel appointed by Google to advise on the implementation of the ruling, the ECJ's ruling, back the company's views that links be removed only from websites in Europe. This is no doubt something uh, we will get onto uh, tonight. Um, that, of course, puts Google at odds with the EU's data protection regulators who said at the end of last year Google should remove links worldwide. Now, we, we've gone with a debate format for this series. It injects a little bit of friction into the proceedings. As I said, uh, it also uh, means you can vote on who you think has argued the, your, uh, the, their case more convincingly. We're going to alternate our speakers for and against, for and against, um, before we open it up to Q&A, uh, ahead of closing statements, and then your chance to vote again, and we'll see to what extent you have uh, been swayed. Uh, I, do want, I, I do want to make one, one short announcement at this point. Peter Barron from Google, on the end there, um, who is, uh, I, 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 
let me put it like this, siding with, uh, with Sir David Oman, um, has, has pointed out that despite, or wants me to point out, that despite his company's opposition to the right to be forgotten uh, in the run-up to the ruling, he does accept both sides of the argument, and Google is now getting on with the job of compliance. And he will talk a little bit about that as well. I saw this great quote, actually, uh, in The New Yorker last September. And here's the quote from uh, a young Google lawyer, David Price, who said, <clears throat> after the decision, we all made frowny faces, but then we got down to work. Came from uh, one of your, your lawyers, uh, Peter. Um, right, let's get to uh, the results of the pre-debate, see where you stand on this. There you go. The yeses, i.e. that free citizens do indeed have the right to be forgotten, were at 50 it was 57, we're down to 53. The no's that they don't at 27, and the undecideds are at 20%. So uh, a lot to play for over the next hour. Uh, as I said, you'll get another chance to vote after we've heard from our speakers. They'll each get eight to 10 uninterrupted minutes. First up, arguing for the motion. So a yes, free citizens do need the right to be forgotten. Jeffrey Robertson, QC, Jeffrey is founder and joint head of Dowdy Street Chambers, well-known human rights barrister, academic, author, and broadcaster. Jeffrey, eight to ten minutes, the floor is yours. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> I will try Here we go, and I've got to uh, uh, reset, start. This is crazy. All right. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Why is privacy a value that calls for protection under every human rights treaty ever devised. Because, I suggest, it recognizes a psychological need for an intrusion-free zone of personality and family, and we usually suffer anguish when that zone is violated. So, in civilized countries, free citizens are entitled to a right to be let alone, to live some part of their life. Uh, behind a door marked, do not disturb. This doesn't mean in any literal sense a right to be forgotten, unless you want to be a hermit. But it boils down in modern law to a right to have a measure of control over information collected about you and presented to the world at large for profit, the profit of internet data dispensers like Google. That right must be balanced with the free speech right to communicate information and with the genuine public interest of the world at large in learning about powerful people. But what is left after that balancing exercise is a core right to correct and, if necessary, to remove information that is false or irrelevant, peddled for profit by purveyors of internet data. Now, the first demand for privacy rights came from Warren and Brandeis in 1890, worried by developments of new technology, developments of photography and the tabloid press that kicked off a development of privacy rights in America, notwithstanding the First Amendment, to stop unconscionable invasions, publication without consent of private photographs or x-rays, medical records, and ultimately, of course, Roe against Wade, which secured a woman's right to abortion. In Britain, John Wilkes had an early triumph over state snoopers who collected data in bulk without lawful warrants, George III's equivalent of David Ormrod. But that was 250 years ago. In 1964, a compassionate Lord Chancellor, Gerald Gardner, guided the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act onto the statute book, a right of citizens to live down the peccadilloes of their youth, not to have held against them crimes for which they'd long before atoned. John Lennon and Stephen Fry were able to use the act to obtain visas to pursue their career in the United States. Minor offenders had their crimes forgotten and lived to be a credit to their professions, including a former DPP whose cannabis possession as a student was ruled to be no bar to his appointment. Well, in 1984, we had the Data Protection Act, the result of a Europe-wide concern about new technologies, again, especially computers, and the damaging activities of credit agencies with no checks on the accuracy of information they were disseminating. 
people were losing credit, losing jobs from dirty data. So a data regulatory agency was established to enforce data protection principles. All data should be processed lawfully and fairly, should be held only for lawful purposes, must be accurate, kept up to date, and so on. What the Data Protection Act did in 1984 was to give citizens some control over the data that's made available about them gives them the ability to access the data and to correct it if it's false or misleading or irrelevant. And that surely is an acceptable and necessary right for free citizens. Well, 30 years on, we have dramatic new challenges to privacy from the mega moguls of the World Wide Web. Google your own name and in a logarithmically calculated list of your online footprints will appear including web pages by you or about you, conversations on chat rooms, out-of-date public records, all sorts of information, the stuff you share with friends on Facebook and social media and so on. And this information aggregated in, within a single narrative will be made available to anyone. And this utterly disables your capacity as a free citizen to know to whom your data is going and it disables your capacity to control it by removing falsehoods or irrelevancies. So what do we do? Obviously and sensibly, we apply the accepted and respected data protection principles to the companies that purvey our personal data on the World Wide Web. And that's precisely what the European Court of Justice did in the Google case for all the hysterical criticism from self-interested purveyors of this bi biographical minestrone, it really was a logical and principled decision. First, it rejected Google's main claim that it was outside the European directive because it wasn't a data processor. It didn't process data. Well, maybe the Pope is not a Catholic and bears don't leave droppings in the woods. But I hope, <laughs> Mr. Barron, your lawyers were well paid for advancing that hopeless argument. <laughs> Secondly, the court applied existing data pr principles to Google. It had to allow individuals to correct data that was false or inadequate or irrelevant. It said in the euro prosaic language we have to put up with from European courts, I quote, the data subject may, in light of his privacy right, request that information no longer be available to the public when linked to his name, because it is inaccurate or inadequate, irrelevant or excessive. In such cases, privacy overrides the economic interests of Google unless there are particular reasons, such as the role played by the data subject in public life, that the interest to the general public is justified. So is there anything wrong with that decision? It gives free citizens some right to control their own personal information by removing lies and irrelevancies, unless they're persons of public interest, in which case all information is deemed relevant. The ruling only applies to the searching for a specific name, and it doesn't delete the underlying web page, so there's no censorship. And it only applies to EU search en engines, so you're still vulnerable on .com. It's not a threat to freedom of the press. It is, I think, valuably in providing a power of self-authorship over the private spaces we inhabit on the net. Well, Google complains about the cost of uh, setting up the checking device. Well, no doubt it could spend more of its tax dodge dollars on uh, setting up truly independent independent regulators staffed by many of the legal profession that are facing legal aid cuts. But face reality, Mr. Barron, Google is not a public library, as suggested earlier. It's a commercial operation. It can't be immune from responsibility when distributing inadequate personal details, which may encourage stalkers, affect psychological health, our capacity to forge meaningful relationships, or indeed our job opportunities. Well, there is another aspect to this debate represented by the presence here of that serial lawbreaker, Sir David Ormond. The investigatory powers tribunal has concluded that under his direction, GCHQ unlawfully collaborated with the Americans 
in bulk interception of data between 2007 and 2014 in the PRISM program. I shall forbear from performing a citizen's arrest on Sir David tonight for conspiring to breach citizen privacy by, I quote, soliciting, receiving, storing, and transmitting private communications of individuals in the UK obtained by US authorities, unquote. His conduct, the court found, breached the rights of our free citizens, both to privacy and to free speech. We all, of course, want to combat terrorism, but not when it involves seven years of unlawful surveillance. Nave Pillay, the Human Rights Commissioner for the UN, commented recently that government mass surveillance is emerging as a dangerous habit rather than an ex exceptional measure. And the ability, uh, not according to this clock, yeah. the ability to collect metadata and aggregation of electronic information can give a precise picture of an individual's behavior, social relationships, private preferences, and identity, as General Petraeus discovered when the NSA collected his metadata and discovered he had a brief affair with his biographer, which for some reason meant he was unfit to lead the CIA, although not, I suppose, the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> so why should information collected by spooks not be lawful and accurate and disseminated carefully so as not to damage individuals about whom it's been collected for other purposes? And uh, those of us who have our information hoovered up should have a right to know whether it's being stored and a right to have it deleted if it serves no national security purpose. And there must, of course, be regulation. So to conclude, free citizens, to be f truly free, need for their humanity, their personality, their psyche, a right to private life. In a metadated world where so much of their personal history can be exposed to public view for the profit of data banks or used secretly in w damaging ways by the intelligence service, the law should provide them with some control over the stories told about them. The right, obviously, to consign falsehoods to oblivion, to remove malicious gossip and rumor, the right to correct misrepresentation and to clarify false impressions, the right to feel confident, especially in respect of police and national security data, that this is being collected fairly and lawfully. There will always be public interest exceptions, and they are. The so-called right to be forgotten is really a right to be remembered appropriately <coughs> so you can be judged for what you are, not for what malicious people think you, you are or even uh, what you may once have been. That seems to us a necessary attribute of every free citizen. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Geoffrey. We, we can always count on Geoffrey to stir things up and, and, and run a little bit over time, two minutes over time. Um, Sir David Oman, uh, former director GCHQ, uh, is up next. Sir David is now visiting professor at the War Studies Department, King's College, London. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Well, I'm, good evening. I'm very sorry that Geoffrey did not conduct a citizen's arrest <laughs> on that matter, because had he done so, I would have sued him, and I would have gained a great deal of money because uh, I left GCHQ in 1998 before PRISM was even conceived of. And whilst I'm at it, Jeffrey's misrepresentation of the recent IPT judgment is so gross that I'm afraid it invites me to say to you that you should disregard most of his arguments. Because what the IPT said, of course, was that the surveillance currently being carried out by GCHQ is perfectly lawful, is entirely consistent with the Europe ECHR Article 8 and 10, and indeed does not amount to mass surveillance. What they did say, very sensibly, was that the government has a responsibility to explain how it works and the case in point, two paragraphs of caveats, of uh, uh, safeguards, which apply when an analyst wishes to access American data about Briti people in the British Islands. Those safeguards should have been explained to the public, and they weren't. And that puts GCHQ, or the Home Office, uh, in technical breach. Uh, but the 
surveillance itself was entirely lawful. So, the right to be forgotten. Could it ever be a right to be added to the other fundamental and vital rights in our Human Rights Act, in the ECHR, in the UN Declaration? That would be a very big and, as I will hope to demonstrate to you, pointless ambition. Is it to be an absolute right, like the right not to be tortured? That would mean I could require of anyone that they take down any information they host about me if I so choose. I assume not. Such a strong interpretation of the right to be forgotten would be impossible to enforce and technically extremely difficult, if not impossible, to implement. How, for example, could I keep track of every photograph of me posted online by somebody else? Does every hoster of a blog that mentions me or Jeffrey have to clean out its databases at my request? So we're not talking about an absolute right, clearly. We could alternatively consider a qualified right on the lines of the right to personal privacy, as Jeffrey has suggested. But the right to privacy is about personal unpublished information. Erasure of obvious personal data, such as bank account details, when requested by the data subject. That's fine. That's absolutely fine by me. But the so-called right to be forgotten isn't about that. It's about information that is on the public record. And that's where the problems start. So I'm afraid I must ask you to disregard most of Jeffrey's arguments because they're about data protection. And we're not talking about data protection here. We're talking about a right to be forgotten in respect of information that's in the public domain. Now, if you think about the fundamental physics of this for a moment, you can see what a nonsense such a right would create. If you knock an egg off the table, it falls to the ground and breaks. There's an arrow of time in the universe called entropy. The odds against being able to unscramble the egg and put it back together are more than astronomical. The event has happened. It cannot be unhappened. It has become a cliche to talk of the flap of a butterfly's wing in Amazonia triggering a tropical storm in China. But the fact is, the digital world, data connects. Now hold that thought in your mind for a moment and just think about the future we're just entering. It's the future internet of things, or as I might call it, the internet of everything. The mobile devices we carry, the sensors we will wear on our wrists, measuring our most intimate medical functions, the digital traces we will leave everywhere, the geolocation from all the apps which we use on all our different devices. Most of that information would be caught by the current definition of personal data because it relates to a living individual who can be identified with enough care from that data if taken together with other data that could be accessed. Our very presence in the world of the future changes the digital totality. And you can't rewrite history to erase all those traces. What you can do and what we should do and what the legal minds and the audience should turn themselves to is to limit the harm that such data can do. Clearly, it will provide us with huge benefits, but we must also watch for the harms. And that's the approach of legislation on rehabilitation of offenders. Perhaps we should be thinking, of, uh, thinking about uh, some further law of torts in the digital world. But that's not a right to be forgotten. You could, of course, interpret the so-called right just to mean to repackage my existing ability to have taken down defamatory and incorrect personal data about myself. And at points, Jeffrey, I think, was that's really what he was talking about. But Google already comply with delete requests when the material violates copyright or is defamatory. Nor would it be that hard for them to give priority to requests relating, for example, to material posted by children. But once you start to think about it as a capital R 
right and interpret, rigorously, uh, interpret it rigorously as Commissioner uh, Vivian Redding seemed to advocate during the debates on the draft uh, regulation. Such a qualified right runs quickly into a head-on clash with the media, a clash with the First Amendment to the US Constitution, journalistic independence. It is marching into a library and insisting at least the book index is pulped. Now, I suspect we would not have heard anything about further about this so-called right, were it not for the ECJ's Google Spain decision, which allowed the lawyer, uh, Mario Castella Gonzalez, to remove references to his earlier financial difficulties from an index of search results. Now, this is to read the right to be forgotten as the right not to be indexed, or more accurately, you might say, a right to make European investigative journalists work harder. The information about the Spanish lawyer, which is a matter of public record, remember my point about the smashed egg, it's there, it's happened, it has changed the world. It's on the public record, it remains on the public record, it can be referred to at any stage by anyone. However, search engines in Europe, but not of course the United States or elsewhere, cannot point to the information if somebody is able to show that it's outdated and of little current relevance. So this approach, this so-called right to be forgotten, protects privacy in a rather, if you like, old-fashioned way. It th throws up tedious obstacles in the way of seekers after information. Obstacles that are not sufficient to prevent discovery but I would concede might, I suppose, uh, discourage frivolous searches. The original information about the Spanish lawyer, which appeared in the archives of the newspaper, remains online. Is that really what we're talking about when we talk about a right to be forgotten? And as I've mentioned, this restriction, this right, only applies to certain European internet domains. One minute. Dot .es, for example, and so has virtually no effect on the ability of somebody finding the information via google.com. I will also mention that it means that any service provided to European consumers, wherever based in the world, will fall under European law, just inviting difficult clashes of jurisdictions. You've got to ask, given the nature of the digital world, what are the conditions under which such a right can be set aside? How would you define those conditions? Uh, who judges the public interest in the information? Google? What is the burden of proof? Uh, does the internet search engine owner also, as the latest draft of the EU directive says, have to be responsible for the erasure of personal data posted by a third party but accessed through the search? engine. The right to for be forgotten will complicate the work of search engine and maybe some of them will just acquiesce in the request and just take it down because it's cheaper to do that, in which case we have really breached Article 10 uh, freedom of expression rights. Or maybe the company will duck and refer all the cases to the local information commissioner creating a bureaucratic nightmare. I hope I've said enough convince you that to introduce a right to be forgotten is to make law by slogan. It is not yet thought through. We would come to regret it. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Joshua Rosenberg is uh, one of Britain's best-known commentators on the law. Uh, he's the presenter of Law in Action, a program he launched in 1984. Joshua is arguing for the motion. You have 10 minutes, Joshua, starting now. I'd like to begin with an example. I thought quite carefully about whether to tell you about this for reasons which I think will become clear very soon. Um, quite a long time ago, I was having a meal in a public place with a woman. I was recognized by somebody, and the next thing that I knew was that a journalist had written a rather nasty piece about me and the woman in a newspaper. 
I did a quick search for this story the other day, and it's still there. I didn't search on Google. I searched on the newspaper's own website. Uh, you will realize that I'm not telling you very much about it uh, because the essential facts of the story are perfectly true, but for reasons that I don't want to go into, I rather wish that the fact that I had had this meal with this woman on this occasion at this particular place had not been made public. Uh, you can take it from me that I regarded it as an invasion of my privacy, and so did the woman that I was having a meal with. Now, I had chosen to do a public job, which meant that I would be recognized by some people. I used to be on television regularly when uh, broadcast television was the main news medium. And uh, in one sense, I just wanted this particular meal to be forgotten, but uh, it never will be. Now, I want to begin by defining my terms. This is a debate, and I have got to persuade you that free citizens need the right to be forgotten. Uh, take off the word don't. Uh, we say, yes, they do. Free citizens do need the right to be forgotten. When I say free citizens, I mean uh, people like you and me. I don't mean terrorists necessarily. I don't have a problem with Sir David Omond monitoring terrorists. I don't have a problem with him monitoring potential terrorists. I don't even mind uh, GCHQ monitoring me if they think that I'm talking to potential terrorists. But I just want them to limit the collateral damage and not to publish private information about me. Now, uh, David Oman said, we must limit the harm done. And I agree with that entirely. He gave the example of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. The Rehabilitation of Offenders Act means that if you have done something minor in your youth, so committed some minor offence, then after a period of time, uh, that can be forgotten about. It doesn't mean that you didn't do it, but it does mean that it can't be reported. And that's the sort of thing that we are seeking when we argue for the right to be forgotten. I must say, I do congratulate Thomson Reuters on choosing this particular subject for this particular debate tonight. Uh, last Friday, the, the owners of the Daily Mirror uh, published an apology on page two of their newspaper. I looked that up last night on the website. Mysteriously, it's disappeared, but I can assure you it was published, and this is what it said. Some years ago, voicemails left on certain people's phones were unlawfully accessed, and in many cases, the information obtained was used in stories in our national newspapers. That's the Daily Mirror, the Sunday Mirror, and the Sunday People. Such behavior represented an unwarranted and unacceptable intrusion into people's lives. We're taking this opportunity to give every victim a sincere and unreserved apology for what happened. We recognize that our actions will have caused some distress for which we are truly sorry. Um, the reason that the Mirror Group, Trinity Mirror, published this particular apology is not very uh, difficult to understand. This was, of course, the first significant admission of phone hacking by a newspaper group not connected with uh, Rupert Murdoch. But the reason for it was that uh, it was a part of a trading update to the stock exchange in which Trinity Mirror said it had increased uh, the amount of money it set aside to pay claimants who are suing it for alleged interception of their voicemails from four million pounds to 12 million pounds. These voicemails um, goes back a long time now. It's the sort of message that we used to leave on people's phones in the time before texts and emails, the sort of messages you might expect to be forgotten in a few days uh, and not the sort of messages you expected to be intercepted and reported by tabloid newspapers. And rather worse still, the sort of messages which if they are published, you would tend to think that uh, somebody had leaked somebody you might have communicated with. Now, you may say the people who were suing the newspapers are famous people, and this is the price of fame. If you court publicity, you lose some of your privacy. You're never going to uh, make it onto the world's most uh, successful uh, newspaper site if you, I don't know, if you're an insurance broker, for example, in somewhere as far away as New Zealand, perhaps. Think again. Um, this was a story that appeared in the Mail Online yesterday. Um, very curious, the uh, newspaper websites have resorted to a sort of 19th century series of four deck headlines and eight, point, eight bullet points uh, which sum up the story for those of little attention. So I can just read that. It says, married insurance boss caught in sex romp with office junior is fighting desperately to keep his job as neighbors reveal his wife and kids haven't been home since the incident. And then there are the bullet points. Man involved in Christchurch office romp wants to keep his job. He is a senior member of the Marsh Limited insurance firm, aged in his late 40s. 
Neighbours say he's been home alone since the incident two weeks ago. He was filmed having sex with a company secretary in her mid-twenties. The woman involved has not been seen at her Christchurch home recently. The romp was filmed by patrons at Carlton Bar across the street. The man's wife found out about the incident after she saw it on Facebook. This is a story about a couple who had what the newspapers describe as an office sex romp late one evening, not realising that with the lights on in their office, they could be seen from outside, and not realising that their office happened to be opposite a pub full of people with mobile phones. And I can tell you that uh, it's just as unlawful, uh, maybe even criminal, to film this sort of thing in New Zealand as it is here, but nevertheless it was filmed and it was put online. And although the couple have not actually been named, uh, the Mail was one of the first newspapers to publish an unpixelated picture of the woman, uh, filmed through the window, and from everything I've read you, it shouldn't be very difficult for everybody who knows them to know who they are. Well, I suppose you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy if you choose to have sex in front of the window when you're opposite a pub, but, and you probably have only yourself to blame if you lose your job as a result of it, and of course the man should have thought of the consequences for himself and his wife and their teenage children. After all, he did work in insurance. He must have known about the risk. <laughs> but, um, you know, men have been having sex with their secretaries in the office for as long as there have been offices and secretaries. And, uh, you know, in the old days, uh, whatever the consequences were, you might possibly have been able to forget them and others might have forgotten them. But surely this couple have the right to be forgotten. And that's why I have some sympathy for Mario Costello Gonzalez, uh, the man who uh, we've been talking about tonight, the man who brought the case uh, decided by the European Court of Justice. Uh, you know what happened. A Spanish newspaper published an auction notice which said his home was being repossessed to pay off his social security debts. Uh, the Guardian published a page, a photograph of that page, by the way, last year, uh, which listed his name. It was just sort of almost more than a small ad. It wasn't a story. It was just a list. And uh, curiously, I checked, and uh, the, the photograph of the page seems to have disappeared, and it's been replaced by a large photograph of a sign which says Google. But uh, the point is, of course, that um, uh, any, if anybody Googled Mario's name, the first thing they would see was this auction notice, and uh, it alerted him, uh, alerted everybody to the fact that 12 years ago he had had money problems. But these had been resolved some years earlier, and he didn't see why those, uh, that information should be published by him. And as Geoffrey has made clear to you, uh, the court found in his favour last May. I just want to emphasise what this means. It is, as, uh, uh, as, as David Omand said, uh, a, a, right to, uh, a right to limit the harm done. Of course I can talk about him. Of course the newspaper has the information there. It can keep it on its website. It's not a secret. Indeed, poor Mario is probably the most famous mortgage defaulter there's ever been as a result of the legal action he took. But you can't search for that information using a European search engine. You can search using google.com. Anybody here in Europe can simply change their default browser to google.com or go to google.com on the website and they'll be able to find this information about. It's only a limited right. What this judgment says is there has to be a fair balance between internet users seeking to access information and the data subject's fundamental rights. You have to balance the sensitivity of the data against the role played by the subject in private life. There was, for example, a time when you didn't ask a lady of a certain age how old she, or how old she was, but if you happen to be the queen, it's all right to report the fact that she is 88. That's the sort of balance. Some information can be made public, others can't. It's just a gesture. It's not going to be able to hide information. It's not going to be able to stop information becoming public. It's just a gesture to respect the fact that we all need the right to be forgotten. It's not going to stop journalists. It's not going to prevent reporters doing their job. It's not going to stop us reporting things of a public nature. It is a very simple and a very straightforward right. It is simply the right that all free citizens need, the right to be forgotten. Thank you very much indeed, Joshua. <clears throat>
plenty for, uh, for Peter Barron to uh, respond to. Peter is uh, Director of Communications for the EMEA region at Google, uh, has been since uh, July 2013. Before joining Google in 08, he was editor of BBC Two's Newsnight. You have 10 minutes, Peter. Thank you very much indeed, Axel, and uh, thank you for having me this evening. Um, it's a pleasure and, and perhaps a, a little surprising to, to be arguing on the same side as uh, Sir David uh, in this context. Um, but as, as Axel pointed out, I'm not going to argue either for or against uh, the motion. And I'm sorry if that spoils the, the symmetry of the, the debate, but as, uh, as the company that's been most closely associated with the right to be forgotten, we've been working very hard in recent months to strike uh, the right balance, and I'm not about to upset that balance tonight. So I'm not going to argue that free citizens don't need the right to be forgotten, but I will give you some facts and figures about Google's experience in complying with the ECJ ruling, which I hope will be helpful in, in making up your mind. So let's go back to a time before the right to be forgotten. It seems like a very long time ago uh, now. Um, it's sometimes assumed that Google wants to link to all the information on the web, but that isn't the case. Uh, over the years, we've, we've removed certain content from our index, such as child sexual abuse imagery, for example, copyright infringing material, which Sir David mentioned, personal de details such as your bank account number. All of those would be removed uh, in the past. But our position before the Costea ruling was that we believe that we should be able to link to information that appears legally on websites who make that content available uh, freely. And if you wanted, uh, as Joshua might, uh, something removed from our index, the best ways to go about it were to go to, to the publisher or to, to court. Uh, so once removed, if, if, if the publisher, for example, agreed to remove some content, then we would recrawl that part of the web, and very quickly that information uh, would disappear. I should, I, I'm not familiar with the Christchurch incident, but I should just say that if such, if such video appeared on, on YouTube, it would almost certainly be removed under our guidelines on, on privacy guidelines, uh, privacy or indeed pornography uh, guidelines. Um, the ECJ ruling in May changed everything, of course. Um, that ruling said that European citizens have the right to ask search engines like Google to delist web pages on a search for their name if that content is deemed, as, as Jeffrey said, irrelevant or out of date, even if that content is published legally and is completely true. So we didn't exactly welcome the ruling, uh, but we did respect the court's decision and we knuckled down to complying with it efficiently and as responsibly as we could. And we hired scores of paralegal assistants to help our lawyers and they've been working full time on this since last May. Uh, and just to give you a, a sense of the scale of it, uh, we've received uh, around 217,000 requests involving uh, 785,000 separate URLs, and we've removed about 40% and rejected just under 60% of those requests. So any European citizen now has the right to request the right to be forgotten, but of course, they don't actually have the right to be forgotten, not, not, not all of them. Uh, if a public interest is, uh, is involved, uh, if, for example, you're, you've been convicted of a serious crime uh, or you're a surgeon who botched an operation, then your request will be rejected. And if you're a public figure uh, and you, who may, of course, want the right to be forgotten, and certainly plenty of public figures have requested it, uh, the court was very clear. Uh, that there is no such right, so I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Joshua, that I, I suspect would, would apply to you. Uh, many of the requests so far have been very straightforward, a, a clear-cut accept or reject, uh, but others uh, raise some very complex legal and ethical questions. So some examples, in, in Italy, for example, we received multiple requests from an individual who asked us to remove 20 links to recent articles about his arrest for financial crimes committed in a professional capacity. We didn't remove those pages from search results. In Germany, on the other hand, a victim of rape asked us to remove a link to a newspaper article about that crime. We have removed that page from, from the search results for a search for her, for that individual's name, although the article about the crime still exists and can be found for other searches. So those seem like straightforward cases, uh, remove and, and reject, but uh, there are many gray areas. What about news stories about convictions that are now spent? 
What about comments that were left willingly on a website at the time but are now regretted? What about an interview freely given about sexual proclivities that the interviewee now wishes he hadn't taken part in? I think that means the interview rather than the sexual proclivities. These are complicated decisions that would in the past have been extensively examined in the courts. How do you judge public interest? When determining that, we've uh, taken into account the, a number of factors, such as whether the, the, the content relates to a politician, a celebrity, another public figure, whether it comes from a reputable news source, whether it involves professional conduct that might be relevant to consumers. But these are our judgment calls, and we wanted independent input. So in recent months, we have been seeking more guidance about how best to comply with the ruling, given that we never expected or wanted to be in the position to make these judgments. In November, the European Data Protection Authorities gave us their guidance, and, and there, is, there is much that we can and do agree with. In fact, their guidance, in most cases, is very close to what we've already been doing. And we also put together uh, an advisory council of highly qualified, independent experts with backgrounds in privacy regulation, in free expression, in journalism, to help inform our compliance process and promote a debate about these issues. Over a six month period, they met in seven cities with 55 experts and had more than 30 hours of debate uh, on these issues in public. Uh, they were independent, they weren't paid by Google. Uh, they wrote the, their report, not us. Uh, and uh, they were free to reach a consensus or indeed to dissent from the consensus view. Uh, and indeed they did dissent con uh, on some occasions from the consensus view. So it's not black and white, but for us it's been a very valuable part uh, of the process of complying with the ruling. And just before I finish, I should uh, try to clear up uh, one or two myths surrounding uh, the way we've dealt with the ECJ ruling. Uh, the most uh, well known is probably the, the Robert Peston case, uh, which happened just as we started making removals. And myth number one about this is that uh, it was suggested that early in the process, a juicy story was made available by Google to one of uh, Britain's most high-profile journalists to demonstrate the problems uh, with the ruling. And uh, that was even suggested to me by the ICO, Chris Graham. I can assure him and, and you that that wasn't the case. It was, it was pure chance. Myth number two was the conclusion that Robert jumped to that a public figure, in this case a banker who had made a, a series of uh, reckless investments, had made the request for removal, something that would clearly go against the public interest. Uh, in, in fact, the request had not been made by the banker, but by someone who'd left a comment on the original story and subsequently regretted it. The story itself was not removed from our index. Uh, as, as Robert said, it was not cast into oblivion. It will not appear only if you happen to type in the name of the person who left the comment. As Robert himself said, what Google has done is not quite the assault on public interest journalism that it might have seen. And we've seen several such cases in, in recent months uh, misreported by, by newspapers, some involving paedophilia and murder, where newspapers jumped to the conclusion that the subject of the story, the wrongdoer, was the person who had requested removal, when in fact uh, an entirely innocent person who was mentioned in the story was the person who made the request. Myth number three, which many predicted at the outset, is that Google would simply agree to most requests uh, for removal to save time and money. And of course, that hasn't happened. Uh, around about 60% of removal requests have been rejected. Every single request is considered by our teams. Uh, there's no automation involved. And if their judgment is challenged by the publisher, we will reconsider it. And if a mistake has been made, we will reinstate it. And nor has the predicted tsunami of appeals from complainants come to pass. Uh, any complainant has the right to approach the Data Protection Authority if they're not happen, happy with our, uh, if, with our decision. You've got one minute. Although publishers have no such right of appeal. So, so far, the number of appeals from more than 200,000 requests is, in, is just in the hundreds. So don't free citizens need the right to be forgotten. We certainly accept that there is an issue here to be addressed, as has been discussed tonight. Uh, for us, the whole process has been an, exercising, an exercise in learning and listening, and as Larry Page said at the beginning of the process, to try to see things from a more European perspective. 
So I'm not going to come down, disappointingly, uh, one way or another on the motion. But one thing we have said from day one is that we think it's essential that we continue to have a proper debate on the right to be forgotten. So thank you for engaging in this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Those were the uninterrupted statements. I want to give you, I'm keeping an eye on the time, uh, I want to give you a, a short uh, uh, window to ask what questions you have for our, uh, our debaters before they then go into their closing uh, two minutes. Let me see if I can kick us off then. Um, I'm interested to ask both of you, actually, this, I, it's something I mentioned at the top, the Europe versus the rest of the world, the, the, the google.co.uk versus google.com. Um, I, 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 I picked this, this quote up, I forget where it was. This marks the beginning of the end of the global internet where everyone has access to the same information and the beginning of an internet where there are national networks where decisions by governments dictate what people get access to. What do you think? That's overstated, that quote. But there is an issue. Uh, if in Europe we legislate through the regulation, the draft regulation that becomes law, then we have created a legal structure which gives this right for the information to be removed, to be mm. unindexed or mm. de-indexed, but only from Europe. Now, frankly, I can't see the point of that. I really can't. Oh, okay. If you can just go on google.com and you'll find the yeah. un dna indexed material. I mean, I take Joshua's point, it's a, it's a, it's a gesture in... in the, but we don't make... We don't create rights for gestures. You the know, point this is, is where we I live in a civilised society. We live in Europe. We're Europeans. We have this right to control our own data. It doesn't matter if you can I, I, find it in America. But you're not controlling it. Because well, Europeans, as Europeans, we have access to Google.com. And yes, therefore... I, it a is very, a pretense. Yeah, yeah, only a very small people, small percentage of people, less than five percent, uh, access Google.com. You, you do default, and it's quite hard actually to get to well, Google. You're, you're wrong. You default you're, to the national domain. But just a, a couple of points on that. One, one is first of all, that, I mean, this ruling was made in the European jurisdiction, and we are carrying it out in the European jurisdiction. Mm. The second point is that it's quite. It, it would lead to a situation where we, we, we've seen in, o in other countries around the world where one country rules that something is, is illegal in that country. Turkey is a very good example, where it's illegal to make fun of the father of the nation, Ataturk, in mm -hmm. Turkey. So uh, on YouTube in Turkey, it, you're not allowed to have videos that make fun of Ataturk. Absolutely fine, because that's the law in Turkey. But what the Turkish government said to us was, no, no, we want you to remove this everywhere in the world. And we said, well, we can't do that. Um, uh, and actually, YouTube was blocked in Turkey as a result of that. So, the, what would what would happen if we if we got into that situation is that any country could effectively uh, impact what happens right around the world would, by, by and you run into this with the, the First Amendment right. in the United States very directly. Will 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 this will will how will this end? Do you think for Google? Well, as I, as I say. We have been complying with, with, with the ruling. I think so, some, uh, you, you quoted David Price, one of my colleagues at yeah. Google, who said we, we made a friendly face. face and then we got on with it. And I think you know, several months on, we, we have been getting on with it. I think we've maybe surprised a number of people about how effectively it has, it has been working. I think longer term, we're moving towards the, the general data protection regulation uh, in, in, in Europe. And this is where we need these, these issues to be teased out and debated as we move towards yeah. that. that. Uh, Jeffrey, how do you think this ends for, for, for Google? Um, this, this question of Europe versus the rest of the world. Uh, so that doesn't seem to me to be an issue. What is notable is how this would never have happened without that European case. Isn't it amazing that we're all largely agreed that kids scribblings on Facebook and uh, inaccurate information and defamatory information, blah, 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 should be removed, and yet there was no actual procedure for having a lot of this stuff removed before the European court judgment. So I think it is an interesting example of how the law advances, of how human rights advance, of how we realize that the sky won't fall 
if there is some right of individuals to control the stories that are told about them. Joshua, do you, given what we've been talking about, do you, should, do you think the ruling, the ECJ's ruling, is a reassuring ruling for, for individuals and their personal freedom? It may not be reassuring, but I fear that uh, what's now proposed by the Commission uh, would take it a great deal further. I mean, they are proposing a new data protection regulation. Um, this, first of all, makes it clear that non-European countries such as uh, Google, when offering services to European consumers, must apply European rules. But then they want to, the Commission is proposing to reverse the burden of proof. It would be for the company and not the individual to prove that the data can't be deleted. And uh, they uh, want an obligation on a controller such as Google, who's made the personal data public, to take reasonable steps to inform third parties of the fact the individual wants the data to be mm -hmm. deleted. So the European Commission wants to go a lot further. I mean, that's one of the things that worries me, um, that, for example, this third party would actually be very difficult in practice to make a third party, for example, if an internet search engine provides a link to a third party's page, then does that p uh, party become responsible for the deletion of all their links? Right. But people posted by people who have no, you know, completely independently. Um, you're and that's going, some, yeah. you're going to very quickly, I think, get into the problem that data that's true there, but perhaps is unflattering to the data subject, mm. is then becomes a contention. So, I mean, I'm all for sensible measures and sensible uh, data protection, but I just think this needs all, quite a lot more work. Yep. Anything from the audience? No? Yeah, OK, we've got one question here, and we've got one question there. Make them quite quick ones, then we're going to hear the summing up. Uh, just, just, there's a microphone. There. Sorry. Um, I think it's a question around what are the long-term implications for the way that we use the internet, how much we can rely on it for doing first-level searches about people that we're maybe doing business with, um, and has there been any work done on maybe on the Google side to sort of look at does this going is this going to change the way that um, you see usage being uh, being conducted? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think we've seen any any impact in, in terms of, of usage uh, whatsoever. Um, I think if you talk to the the newspapers about the impact on, on the right to be got forgotten, it's probably the newspapers who've, who've been most exercised about it because it, it, it's their material that 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 people are are, are potentially not getting access to. And it, it's, a, it's a slightly strange situation that there is a journalistic ex exception that, the, 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 indeed, in the case of Mario Costea, the, the original offending article is, on, is in the newspaper and continues to be available on the website of that, of, of that newspaper, even though we're not allowed to, uh, or even though we, for a search for his name, uh, we're not allowed to, to, Peter, to link your, to it. Your transparency report listed the 10 top. Uh, applicants for delisting yeah. of URLs, Facebook came first, yeah. and then social media sites, newspapers weren't in the top ten. Well, that's a very fair point, and it's very interesting actually that, that, that Facebook is, is number one, because I, my understanding is that in, in many cases, certainly with Google's platforms in that area, you say it's, it's, it's not your data to control. Actually, in, that, in those cases, it is your data to control, and you can remove uh, you know any uh, content along those lines from from Google services in, in, in that kind of area, and I, I suspect you can also remove it from from Facebook as, as well. So it is quite interesting that, that Facebook is the is the number one area there. But certainly, uh, in terms of true factual information, legally published, uh, that's what has, has exercised the newspapers most. Um, and you know, it, 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 it clearly is a, it's a concern to us as well. Okay, very quickly. Um, isn't it one of the greatest harms that Here people do to each other in the modern technological world is this extraordinary degree of lack of discretion in the publicity they associate with their own lives? And isn't it one of the dangers of a, of a very general, what um, Joshua Rosenberg described as a, a gesture type right? You'll give the impression to people that they don't have to be responsible for their own actions. Whether that's the posting of, of information about themselves or perhaps um, late night activities in, in an office in New Zealand. 
And this right will not actually protect people, it will give the impression that it is, and you will not actually therefore be proving it was own protection of mm. itself. Mm. What do you think, Geoffrey? Well, I just think people are entitled to a degree of protection against their own stupidities, against something put on in <coughs> temper on Facebook and removed immediately, but which is, uh, stands out. Uh, people are vulnerable. People are uh, mentally disordered. People have kids in particular with temper problems or learning difficulties will. Uh, do stupid things, will make stupid entries on Facebook and so forth. I think there is something to be said for uh, a right to be forgotten to protect people from themselves when they're in, particularly when they're in vulnerable situations. And um, right, I'm going to give you the opportunity now to do your, your, your summing up. Uh, one and a half to two minutes each. I'm going to be very strict on the timing here. Um, we will start with you, Geoffrey, and then no, we'll, we'll go end to... with me. It, can, can we start with you, Geoffrey? No, you ended. You, I was told it's going the other way around. <laughs> you obviously <laughs> haven't been Geoffrey. briefed, <laughs> but I will we, start. We, 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 we changed our minds, and I apologise right, that we didn't let you know. But, but I'm happy, Geoffrey. To go if, first, if, if you could go, go first, first, that would last be great. Or in between, <laughs> look, we the right to be forgotten was clumsily inserted in the English translation of the Google judgment. I don't think it's what the court meant to say, and it said it in French. It is really a right to control data about ourselves. Uh, David and I could sit down for an hour or so and agree, I think, on all the data that uh, you should kick out. You should uh, not publish false or inaccurate or misleading data. And Google, I think, has come to realize and is now doing a responsible job thanks to this case. There is, I think, a problem with data that is actually true but is used in a very misleading way. I'll give you one example. I was doing a Radio 3 program a few years ago on choice of music, and the interviewer read the introduction, blah, 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 and he performs, he sells his books at Marxist literary festivals. I thought, what the hell? What, where did you get that from? I said, Oh, oh, researcher called Wikipedia. And there, there is a note, and uh, he, he sells books at, Mar at a Marxist literary festival with a, a, a note to some Yorkshire mine workers event that I <laughs> sold a book at. Look, I sell books whenever anyone asks me to sell my unsuccessful <laughs> book. I've sold books at the Cato Institute, which is the most right-wing foundation in the world in Washington. And I wouldn't have minded if it had said he uh, sells books at all, <laughs> anyone who asks him, from mm -hmm. far right-wing to, to left-wing Marxist. But that was inserted in Wikipedia, I'm sure, maliciously to give the impression I was a Marxist. Now, read on Radio 3, it was simply embarrassing. But who knows, <laughs> well, the spooks right. would have got so, this. So it's that seconds. kind of inadequate, that is that kind of irrelevant, that kind of misleading information that we really need a right to correct. I got someone who knows how to correct Wikipedia entries to do it. Um, now, at least, when this sort of thing happens, and something that is, has a kernel of truth, but is actually used in a way that is, is, gives a false impression, and now I have a right mm. to, and as a free citizen, uh, we all need that sort of right, that protection against distorted, perverted uh, use of information that could be very damaging. All right. Geoffrey, thank you very much indeed. Peter Barron. Yeah, I think I would sort of step back a little bit and, and, and look at the wider picture uh, in Europe and, and the wider sort of regulatory uh, landscape. And I, you know, there's a lot of concern in Europe at the moment about where our, the next phase of economic growth is going to come from. A lot of concern that uh, that Europe has fallen behind in the in the tech race. That that, that uh, it's American companies like Google and, and others who have been successful in this period. Uh, and and uh, w where is the where is the European Google or Facebook or or Twitter? They haven't emerged uh, yet. And there's a lot of governments around Europe who spend a lot of time thinking about how to to stimulate that kind of environment that leads to uh, tech success. Now, Jeffrey has rightly pointed out that, that you know, Google 
has, a, uh, has been able to, to deal with the, the consequences of the right to be forgotten because we are um, a, a wealthy company and we've, we've, we've managed to uh, put in place uh, scores of people to, to handle this huge uh, caseload and, uh, and handle it reasonably uh, efficiently and, re and responsibly. But ask the question about what happens when a new startup search engine uh, goes into business in, in, in Europe. Uh, I, I, I was on a panel at, at ITN, I think, uh, with Joshua a few, a few months ago, and this question was, was asked to, to the, the Information Commissioner, Chris Graham, and his answer was, it will simply be a cost of business for uh, new tech companies operating in Europe to, to deal with the, the right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not an insignificant task uh, certainly that, that, that we've had to face, but what about the, the new company, perhaps with uh, 15 or, or, or 30 staff, who these days could reach a, a global audience of, of billions of people, they will be saddled with the same uh, task of, of dealing with the right to be found. Right. So I think we need to think about that. Peter, thank you very much indeed. Joshua. Um, let me address the questions that we had from the audience. The question from over here was, it's really the fault of the individual who uh, has sex in the office with the lights on. Uh, you're telling people they don't have to be responsible uh, for themselves. Well, yes, in reality, those people are widely named and shamed. Their names may not be published, but everybody knows who they are. And in practice, in the real world, there's not much that can be done. The questioner over here says, you know, are we not going to be able to rely on the internet anymore? Well, we are, because this is information is going to be made public. So all we're really proposing on this side of the argument is that there should be a gesture, that you should simply say, yes, people do need the right to be forgotten. Let me end with a, a vignette, a story about Justine Sacco. Do you know the story of Justine Sacco? She was the senior director of corporate communications at IAC, a huge American media and internet company. You may find that strange in view of what happened. She was traveling from New York to South Africa to see her family over Christmas just over a year ago. She tweeted about the indignities of travel. Uh, she complained about somebody on her plane who had BO. She complained about uh, how chilly it was in London, cucumber sandwiches and bad teeth. Uh, and then she, just before she left for Cape Town, she tweeted, going to Africa, I hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Anyway, this message was sent to her 170 followers. It was picked up by somebody who has a great deal more. During the time she was on the plane to South Africa, oblivious to this, it was tweeted. When she arrived, her phone didn't stop ringing. Uh, she lost her job. Uh, she uh, spent some time abroad trying to recuperate. She found another job. And finally, when approached by John Ronson, the author who wrote about all of this, uh, she wouldn't talk to him about it uh, because she said uh, she had a new job in communications. Anything that puts the spotlight on me is a negative. And this is the final part of the story and the one that addresses the gentleman over here. She revealed the hidden cost of what happened to her. She said to Ronson, I'm single, so it's not like I can date because we Google everyone we might date. That's been taken away from me too. Free citizens do need the right to be forgotten. Thank you very much indeed, Joshua. And uh, so, Dave, well, clearly we there's quite a lot we agree on. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think there is. But I'm inviting uh, the audience to uh, cast their final vote against this, really because I don't think rights are gestures. And I think we cheapen the concept of rights once we start talking about it's a, it's a gesture. Um, I am still uncomfortable that Google is made the arbiter of the public interest. I'm worried about the clash of jurisdictions. There's enough of that around, goodness me, without adding to it. I'm worried about the future because it is going to be dig even more digital. Mm. And I don't think we've, we're still in a 20th century debate here. We haven't got our minds around what it's going to be like when we have the Internet of Things. And the amount of, we may have to rethink quite a, quite a lot of things. Which is why my hunch is that we're up a blind alley talking about removing information. When with digital, modern digital techniques you can connect information and you can de-anonymize and so on. I think we should really be thinking about how we improve redress for misuse or prevent uh, misuse. 
rehabilitation of offenders that we both mentioned, you can't remove the newspaper references that are in the Cuttings Library. So the information is there. But what you can do, and we do do with our legislation, is to say you can't deny somebody a job, for example, mm. because of their previous conviction. And that's an example of what I mean by thinking <laughs> through, can we actually get to grips with the misuse of data? But don't think in a digital world we can go around kind of just pulling it all out. Some we can, bank account details, but that's the trivial end. Uh, the really important stuff will be with us in a year or two with the internet of everything. Right, so David, many thanks for that. Before we thank our panel, I'm just going to pop up to the podium again because I need to be able to see the screen. The I want to invite to you to make your final votes now. Um, as I said, you can do it on the app and you can do it uh, texting. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. I mean, it shouldn't take more than 30 seconds, hopefully. Uh, do get those phones out and those iPads out. But as you do that, and before we grab a drink, I wanted to uh, mention uh, that we have uh, three uh, forthcoming debates, which will be held on the 16th of April, the 21st of May, and the 30th of June. Um, they will focus on corporate crime, law and society in the ECHR, uh, and the future of law. Uh, we'll keep all of you updated on the legal debate series uh, via email so that you don't miss out uh, on another uh, interesting evening. Uh, I want to thank all of you for coming. As I said, we're going to have uh, a drink. Uh, we're going to have uh, some canapes outside. You can all have a chat about uh, what you thought about this evening. Let's take a look now at how you voted. All right. Let me just remember, this is, uh, we've had some, uh, some uh, change here. I just want to remind you, the first vote, the first vote was 57 yeses. That has dropped to 38% of yeses. The noes were 23. They've gone up to 59%, and the undecideds have dropped uh, to three. So I can safely say, guys, that the motion uh, is defeated. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.